in the next pandemic, what would you do differently? Um, some of the things that, that come to mind right away is to, um, at least for like um, communication, would be to uh, just have like one, one central spot. So, you know, we started this um, trying to communicate to families as best we could from all schools. Um, quickly centralize all of that communication. We don't often translate things that are going home. I think that's been a huge piece is that people just overlook the amount of translation that needs to go and then I can tell you at the beginning of this pandemic parents were complaining about the amount of communication because we were scrambling to come up with solutions. So they were being communicated by the district, they were getting communicated by the school, they are getting communicated from their teacher. It was almost overwhelming, especially because all of these people were using different modalities to communicate. So imagine that you're an immigrant to this country and now all of a sudden, you know, not only are people not translating the information into your home language, um, but they're using all these different forms to communicate with you. You're trying to keep track of several kids as everybody's doing this. That type of process is what led to additional inequities for our children uh, when we did the switch to distance learning as well. So for me as a teacher, the, the hardest part of all of this has been that I've had to kind of repackage my entire curriculum into week-long chunks and make sure that I have all of that uploaded and ready for them to go on Monday mornings. Um, because before, I just put assignments up as we got to them and I just kind of like, you know, did a brief lecture on it the first day that we started that assignment. And um, yeah, having to think about everything like two or three weeks in advance is like, oh, this is, this is taking up all of my time when I could be doing grading. <laughs> so I fell, I fell behind on grading uh, quite a bit during this, uh, this last school year. Um, from an instructional standpoint, we've been able to or forced to navigate uh, three different models of instruction, the day-to-day face-to-face model, a hybrid model where half the students are in school one day and half the students are there another day, and then a full distance learning where students work 100% through a distance learning model and offsite. And so everything that we have had to do within the last year has changed dramatically. And fortunately, I believe that the majority of that work has led to amazing innovation and dynamic work within the school district, and we are better for it. In the summer, I felt that most educators, administrators, they were holding on tight to this idea that learning was going to fall in one of three buckets. We were gonna be in person, uh, we were gonna be hybrid, or we were gonna be distance learning, and that the state was gonna come in and tell us what to do. And so some teachers, some schools were saying, I'm not gonna plan anything until we know what we're going to be in. And some teachers wanted to get everything, their ducks in a row. And then when the announcement came, um, what you saw is that there was really everything in between and it really mattered what your COVID rates were and also that students could change in between the models, which has big implications for what you're planning, for your staffing, all of those things. And so again, I think that's what people have been living with is this uneasiness of not knowing what education is going to look like next week. Even if we're in person, there's a chance that we would have to quarantine and have to quickly switch everybody online, whether that's kindergartners or seniors. And so nobody has ever felt, I think, this at ease and that, okay, we finally settled into our modality. And I think people have become more comfortable with not knowing what's happening and uh, more comfortable with the technologies, the expectations, finding their groove a little bit, at least educators have been. I, I learned during spring semester of last year I learned the hard way that like, oh, a lot of the written instructions that I have for my assignments are not super great. <laughs> and a lot of my students like get caught up on things and have like just little questions about them. And when we're all in the classroom, it's not a problem because they just like raise their hand and I come over for two seconds and I go, oh yeah, you're just supposed to click here and here and like that's what you're doing. But when they have to join me in a Google Meet, it's like the, the barrier to entry for that is way, way higher. So um, over the last year, I have been kind of building a collection, a larger and larger collection of video tutorials, right? All of my lessons, most of my lessons now have videos associated with them. And I know that a lot of teachers have been kind of trying to 
go back to basically the way that things were before, having their lessons, their lectures and things in class, and then they invite all of their uh, students who are at home to join in a Google Meet. And I, I know partially from experience, but also from like talking to folks who, you know, have been working from home um, that like, it is impossible to run, you know, a group conversation, uh, a conference call where like some people are in person and some people are virtual and like be able to serve both of those groups equally. So I decided uh, when we came back into the building, I was like, okay, I am just going to be pre-recording all of my lessons, putting them in Schoology. Um, and so then, whether students are at home or in the classroom, that's how they access that information. They just watch the, the video. And so then my time here in the classroom is essentially office hours for the students who are in the classroom. I do, I, I have worried though, like when we moved back into the building, um, I was having a conversation with some of my coworkers who like, you know, for classes like pottery or auto tech, where it's like, how do you even, how do you do that distance learning? I don't, you know. And I was talking to one of my colleagues who was like, oh yeah, it's great to have them back in the lab and they can actually do work. And I was like, so how are you serving the students who are at home equally as well as the students who are here in the building? And he was like, I'm not. And I was like, you have to. That's like, number one, we've been directed to do that. Number two, that's the right thing to do. <laughs> and that like, whoo, um, that conversation like, it took me a while to process that. I probably still have not, you know, <laughs> completely gotten over it, but it's distressing.